like while you're waiting in your like, Do you want to save this for your ad kind of Well, we'll do, we'll do, oh, do we lose the mic? Check, check. Hello, hello. And you even have like Halloween 3 nods in the new film that I caught in the trailer. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have a panel uh, from the new Halloween film at 4.30. Uh, it'll be Malika, David Gordon Green, uh, uh, and a bunch of people. Um, and uh, who, are, who are able to come out. Uh, but Halloween came about in 2015 when I found out that Bob and Harvey Weinstein, blah, they were not shooting their movie. They were supposed to be shooting a film that summer, uh, like an actual sequel. And so I didn't hear much buzz about it, and so I just kind of put in a few calls, and it was like, to those who were supposed to be involved, and I said, what's going on with the movie? Are you guys shooting? How is shooting going? And they said the shoot, shooting wasn't going at all. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Um, so I made a few more calls, and I found out that Bob and Harvey likes to lost the rights. And so, I called Jason, my boss, and I said, Jason, the rights for Halloween are up. And if there's any franchise that we should get involved in, I know it's a little off brand for a company that's built on supernatural stuff, then I mean, we should get it. We should, I don't know what we would do, but we should get it and really just try to make the Halloween franchise something really cool and really scary. And, uh, and then he emailed me back, he called me back and he just said, I'm all over it. So, he, so I didn't hear about it for about a week or two, and then I ran into Malik, uh, and I've known Malik since I used to work for Pangoria, and, uh, and he's like, I heard we're, we're talking about something cool, and I said, yeah, we were just kind of talking in broad tones, and then the next thing I know, we're getting a phone call and saying, Ryan, come to Miramax, we're going to have a big meeting, and we're going we're gonna to talk about why we should be doing this movie, and it was me and Jason and Malik, and we're going to run over and try all the heads of Miramax, it was the most nerve-wracking thing I've ever been to um, because it's just basically, I just had to kind of, Jason did the pitch as to financially why it should work, and I just kind of did the pitch as to why we should do a new movie and why, what we do. And our whole thing at Blumhouse is really about uh, being director-driven. So while we didn't have a take, we just knew that we wanted Michael Myers to be scary again, we wanted the Halloween franchise to be super cool again, and we would find a director to just kind of take us in the right direction. Did you, as a Halloween fan, did you think about, because the, the, the timelines and mythology is, is so dense at this point, was there ever a thought of it being a sequel to the originals, to the Rob Zombie movies, to the Dolphin Awards, or did you always think we need to just be fresh and start from scratch? We initially thought about just going to complete Batman Begins. And just, I mean, we used two, we used two analogies. One was Batman Begins, and one was Batman Begins. You forget everything that Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton did, and just kind of restart and, and create a new kind of composition, a new Batman. Chris Nolan did it, basically. So we've actually thought about doing it, like just kind of cleaning the slate with a kind of new Laurie and a new Michael, and just trying to figure that out. And then Star Wars Force Awakens became part of the conversation and what they did. And so that was more exciting. I got David more excited. But the funny thing is, David came in and he didn't necessarily have a pitch, but he said, um, I'm really into this I'm the franchise. Uh, if I do it, I'd love to bring a writer in. Um, and I said, Which writer? He said, Danny. And I said, Cool, Danny who? And he said, Danny McBride. And I went, What? <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, Yeah, Danny's a huge horror fan. And then it cuts to you like two weeks later, Dan and David came in, and Dan was like, you know, verbal, verbal sparring and horror facts and fun deep cuts. I mean, he was amazing. Like, I forgot, I threw like a really random Jason Goes to Hell reference. I guess we were just kind of spitballing ideas and stuff. Jason Goes to Hell came up. And, and Danny was the only one in the room who got it. He was like, you talking about Jason Goes to Hell? I'm like, yeah, he was oh. <laughs> so we just knew that we were right. Really cool. What about uh, Jesus Christ going to hop? Um, restarts. You were mentioning restarts. It's not the first time they actually did restart, right? We're talking about Halloween 3. It's something we've never even talked about. She deeply curious of what you guys thought of Halloween 3 when you first saw it, because when I first saw it, I mean, it's become, I've watched that more, much more than any other film in the mm -hmm. franchise. I watch it every year. When I first saw it, I was deeply disappointed and like didn't even know what to make of it. I didn't even understand it. I think I was like nine. 
oh, I just didn't understand what I had just watched because I was waiting for every beat for Mike Myers to suddenly pop up. So I'm curious because I, we've never really spoken in depth about this movie before we double down. I think I actually saw Season of the Witch before I actually saw Halloween. Um, for some reason, I remember that one, seeing that one much younger, and I didn't see Halloween until I was in middle school, but I remember seeing Season of the Witch super young, and I loved it. Yeah. It, was, it was like everything I needed as a kid, like kick-ass masks, spiders, and snakes. I didn't get the whole witch stone hinge stuff then, but it, everything I had so early. Um, but still, it was just like it was everything I needed as a kid, and the, the song and everything, so I had I grew up in love with Halloween too. That's one that was on TV. Uh, so I kind of went backwards from that. Woo! Thank <laughs> you. 
but um, yeah. My first impression was uh, Tommy Lee Wallace asked me to star in the movie, and it was a good script and a good story. And and then uh, he called me one day and he said, we, "We're still putting it all together." And he said, "Will you come over and read with these people?" Uh, the girls. We narrowed it down to a few girls and trying to pick, pick uh, Miss Primbridge. And uh, I went over and I can't remember there were three or four girls, and I can't remember anybody except Stacy when she walked in the room. And we read it, and there was obviously a nice thing, nice uh, rapport. And so we knew as soon as she left the room that she had the part. And we had a great time up in Northern California somewhere. I can never remember the name of the town. And, but that's not anything to do with my first reaction to the script. I liked the script and I was happy to do the job. It was a job and jobs are always good. <laughs> How did you first uh, meet John Carpenter before the fall? What? How did you first meet Carpenter before the fall? How was your entry into that circle with John? Um, I think you've done the Fog and Escape from New York right before this, right? So when was the first time you worked with John and Edward? This is how I met John Carpenter. Adrian Barco is a dear friend of mine, longtime friend, longer than John. And um, she was dating him. And she said, uh, I want you and uh, Garner to come watch this screening of uh, Halloween that this guy is directing. I think um, I think this is serious and I want to know what you think. <laughs> so um, we went to the screening of this screening director's bill or whatever over the hill in Hollywood and um, took our friend uh, Garn's uh, friend Jeannie. Garn was my first wife. She was in Halloween too. So she took uh, Jeannie and uh, another lady friend from uh, L.A. And so I'm in the middle and they're on either side. And before long, they're like this. Oh, God. Can we look? Can we look? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go, look down. Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh, my God. Oh, God. So, at the end of the movie, they leaned across in front of me and said to each other, we cannot let Adrienne marry this guy. <laughs> that was my first, and uh, I met him that night, and then I spoke at their wedding up in Northern California, where uh, baby's from, and then I started working with him. That was it. <laughs> was there anything about his, his demeanor or personality? Director, was there any particular thing about him that you felt confident about? You don't necessarily have to trust in your director as an actor. <laughs> if you're an actor and you know what you're doing, you can usually trust yourself and your own instincts. But John was great in that he gave a good framework to work within a scene, to knew what he wanted out of a scene, and he was. Uh, he was terrific to work with, and um, he, he's not easiest guy in the world to work with, but he was uh, he was really good. I thought he made terrific films, and when he he was worried about the fog, in that it's it's an old fashioned ghost story, and. scary enough, I'm not going to grab people in, and I thought the opening was wonderful, that story about uh, with the old man on the beach with the boys around the campfire, uh, John Houseman, and then the camera goes up into the dark sky and then comes down over the bay of, what the hell was it called? Antonio Bay. It is Bodega Bay, what is it? Antonio Bay. Antonio Bay. And I thought, oh wow, that's so wonderful. So he added, though, 
All these things where the gas station hose falls out and shit falls off the shelves in the store and different scary things for no apparent reason uh, going on. One of my favorite memories of the fog was uh, it was uh, all of my movies are old, as you might know. And you look at me and you know I am old. And it was the day, you know, long before uh, CGS, C yeah, computer generated shit. <laughs> and, uh, so, one of my favorite memories was looking, watching Tommy Lee Wallace and uh, Bernardi, I think, I don't know, some of them bunch of guys down the end of the street with two little fog machines and two house fans and you would put me in the corner of a room, you know, to get try, try to create this fog that was terrifying somehow <laughs> to come up the street and fill the street with dread. And it took all night. We were howling with laughter and every time we would start looking good at breeze kick out and blow it all away. <laughs> oh, that, that was fun. We had a wonderful time shooting fog up there in Northern California. It was beautiful. You know, uh, I don't know much about your early days in the acting business, but when did this all start for you? When did you get a sense that you really wanted to be an actor in a profession? Oh, that's one of my favorite stories. I was majoring in journalism at Duquesne University, and I was dating this tomato young girl and she was involved with the Red Masters, an extracurricular theatrical group that was run by the speech department. And uh, I said to her one day, you know, this is uh, pissing me off because I'm not getting my fair share of your time. You're always over at this goddamn theater rehearsing or, or doing, you know. And she said, well, come on over and join up. You could do anything, anything you want. You we're doing a play called The Time of Your Life, the William Sorolian play. It's got about 50 people in it, and you could be somebody. <laughs> and, and then we'll see more of each other. I said, that's a good idea, I'll do that. <laughs> so I did, I played uh, the day bartender, Nick, I think his name was. Uh, no, I didn't, I played a cop. <laughs> Played the first of many, many roles as cops. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. And I had somebody, somebody said to me, the wife of the guy who ran that group sent me a photo of me as the cop in, in that place, 1,243 years ago. <laughs> and that's, and I, I really thought, this is kind of fun. And um, I did a play. Uh, called Talking to You, or Hello Out There, another Sporanian play, and I played Blackstone, a black prize fighter, heavyweight fighter, and I got shot by Blick, the cop, the detective, the nasty guy, and I fall down these steps in my reaction to the gunshot, and I'm laying in the back with all these college kids and parents and shit, and um, and I'm laying there thinking, I could lay here all day. <laughs> they are just waiting to see, am I dead? Am I gonna get up? Am I okay? What's gonna be here? It was so silent, I thought. That was it, that's what I thought. Way too much fun. I, I, and I think I've spent the rest of my life seeking that moment in everything I've ever done. Sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. Was the, uh, I'm curious about the Pittsburgh connection, because I know you were from Pittsburgh, and I know you ended up working with Romero, but was Pittsburgh the place you and Romero actually connected, or it had nothing to do with it? What? My, uh, living in Pittsburgh. My connection with George? Yeah. No, no, I had everything. Okay, so what were you? Yeah, no, it, it did. It was, uh, I knew George from Pittsburgh, and then, um, another one of my favorite little goofball 
stupid stories, but um, soon after I was out with McCain, I, I moved right to New York and started working as an actor. But I think I was still in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which I did for one year, and then I started working as an actor. But I came back for a, a, a party, some big fraternity banquet thing or other, and um, a friend of mine, Paul Raley, the fraternity brother, said, uh, you know, while you're in town, you could do this uh, commercial. It's a beer commercial. I know you love beer. <laughs> They've asked that uh, if, you, if you want to do it, you, the part is yours. It's a local, you know, you won't make much because it's a, a local beer, I don't city beer. And, um, but it's a commercial and George Romero's shooting it. I had no idea who George Romero was. He hadn't made the Night of Living Dead Dead. Or it had to come out. And he was shooting it though. And I said, that because the date directly conflicted with the day of the party. And I said, I don't want to go gathering. I don't want to do a commercial for a few bucks. That will it. And then George would laugh about that later. He uh, invited me to do Creep Show, I think was the first that I did with him. And I did three films with him. Great guy, wonderful big bear of a guy, as 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 huggy and and personable as John is <laughs> <laughs> Very opposite. But both wonderful directors. And George, yeah. So I'm in LA now, and uh, he and Chris are out there, Chris Monero, his uh, first wife, uh, casting creep show, accepting the script, and I went in to meet with them and talk with them. And we schmoozed for a little bit, talking about Pittsburgh and the Steelers and the Pirates and all that crap. And then he said, so, is there any role in there you would like to play? I said, yeah, I would love to play that guy who's all by himself and gets eaten up by the swamp shit. <laughs> and he said, um, I can't. It, uh, Stephen King is, you know, he wrote it and he, he wants to play that role. I said, okay. And he said, would you do the dad at the beginning and the end? And I said, sure. And we did. I had a wonderful time doing that. And shot up in Pittsburgh. And the kid in the movie was Stephen's son, actual son, who I slapped. <laughs> Stephen was so worried about that. He hovered around that scene and kept asking me, Tom, you're not going to hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> sound good later on. And he said, okay, okay. Look, me and the kid were fine. Stephen was a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> what were your first impressions of Stephen when you first got on set? Stephen. I'll tell you exactly what my first impression was. I was in the honey wagon and uh, getting ready. And he, well, there's a rap on the door. And I opened the door and there was, uh, it might have been George or Tom Sabini or something. I think it was George. And George said, Tom, I just wanted you to meet Stephen King. And Stephen looked up at me in the doorway of the thing and he, he had this wonderful, mischievous leer on his face. And he said, What's J.D. Lee Curtis really like? <laughs> That was my first impression. <laughs> He's a great guy. We corresponded. We wrote letters back and forth to each other during those years. Don't anymore, but we did that. It was funny. By the way, that was boy, yeah, Joe Hill. Yeah, Joe Hill, writer in his own way. And probably 40 years old. And, um, I was at a show like this in uh, uh, Worcester, Mass, and uh, this shape appeared next to my table. And I looked up and there's this totally brown hair, runs 
right into the beard that runs right in, and all you can see are eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he leaned out, and before he said anything, I said, Is there a Joe King in there? And he said, Joe Hill, not Tom. Joe Hill. I got a table in the back with a pack of books. So that was, it was a real pleasure seeing him again. Have you ever read any Joe stuff? No. Sad to say, I have not. It was good. Any fun stories from people something that you can share? I think that was the very first film I ever saw that, uh, which you were in. So. Lethal Weapon? Yeah, a couple. I know it's off brand, but it's on it. It's hard. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Lethal Weapon, Gary Busey kills me every time. <laughs> you only have two scenes. You only have two scenes in the movie. One in the bank with uh, Danny Glover asking him to kill everybody, kill them all, because they killed my daughter caused her death, and I, and, and uh, Mel Gibson was on the edge of it, uh, over behind the counter somewhere, and saying the second scene, I get killed by Gary Busey from a helicopter with a gun rifle, and he shoots me dead. Gary and I were down at uh, Western Costume, getting, uh, Fitted for our stuff that we wore. He did, he wore crap pretty much, you know, street stuff. But I, they made two gorgeous, well fitted two, um, Issam Aram suits to me. A pinstripe gray for the bank, a pinstripe dark blue for my wake at home where I got killed. And Gary is on the phone with Richard Donner. We're right in the same space. Gary, Gary is saying, I'm not going to be a fucking mulatto. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that the word? No, wait. No, the, with no hair, blonde. No, 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 does that have to do with anything? It doesn't have anything to do with my part. I don't want to be a fucking albino. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to. Hey, I don't give it. I'm not. What? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, all right. Bye. He needs an albino. As <laughs> Richard Donner said, Gary, I'll have somebody else. It's easy. You ain't the albino, somebody's going to be the albino. <laughs> so you know. Another, another thing about Gary was that he, he and Mel Gibson rehearsed this fight that they had at the end of the movie. All during the movie, whenever they weren't shooting, they were rehearsing this fight, choreographing it, working it out, making sure nobody got hurt. And, and then when they shot it, it was at night with a helicopter going over with a kind of strobe light coming down on it, a fire hydrant shooting water up in the air, mud all over the place. You couldn't see shit. It didn't matter what they did. They could have been slapping each other. <laughs> all that work and effort that they put in putting that fight together was, I thought it was hysterical. And their, the last thing, Mel Kitchen was terrific. Although we didn't have anything directly to do with each other. But he was a young man, as we all were, and he had this um, outside of his honey wagon, he had this little personal one man trampoline. And he would spend, when he wasn't rehearsing to carry and fight, he would spend just jumping up and down on this <laughs> trampoline. Not high, not making a big deal out of not doing tricks on it or anything, just jumping up and down and smoking. He smoked like a chimney. And, and I said to him, now what's, it, what's that do for you? He said, Tom, Tom, come here, here. you try it, you try it. So I, I did it. He said, see, you might not think it, but every muscle in your body is working to keep you on that. 
just to just you every single and and he was in great shape and that's how he stayed in great shape. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about some of the uh, some of the actors that, that you uh, got to work with over the years. In particular, on Escape from New York, there's this wonderful photo of you, John, and Lee Van Cleef cracking oh, up on set. Yeah. And so, and you have Lee Van Cleef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. So I was wondering, you talked a little bit about working with. Uh, I assume there were people that um, that you uh, admired and saw. Like mean, Lee Van Cleef is one of my heroes. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh, he was wonderful to work with, a real gentleman, a real pro. He was dying of cancer at the time. It was one of the last films, if not the last film he made. But he, uh, you would never know it. He, he was there on time every day, knew his words. He was, he was just great, easy as. And, effortless in, in the way he worked and it showed on the screen. You know, just had a great presence. And when we weren't, you know, setting up or doing or rehearsing the shot, he would go over inside and fire up his pipe, his smoke pipe, and he would just shoot the breeze and talk with everybody. It was really easy to him. Wonderful, wonderful guy, sad. I worked with uh, Jimmy Garner too in Rocker Files, and he was a wonderful, one of the best actors I ever worked with in my life. He was great, and also easy going, and knew what he was doing, and had a great time doing it, and made it made it wonderful on set for everybody too, because he just liked that. Most actors are, I think, most stars. Big actors. There are a few that aren't. Yes. Yeah. There's another uh, car ride film I wanted to ask you about, which is um, the great William Peter Wiley, the author of The Exorcist. He worked with twice, Ninth Configuration uh, and uh, Exorcist Three, I guess. Uh, what was he like? You know, because he seems to be incredibly cerebral. And all. Ninth Configuration looks like a lunatic asylum of some of the great actors all hanging out together. Ninth Configuration. Like, what do you mean? Who, who were you asking about? Oh, I was asking you about William Peter Blatty. Just yeah. working with William Peter Blatty. I'd love to know what he was like as a director, because yeah. we know him as a writer. But... I did something else with it. Uh, it's just a three. Were you having a small part now? Oh, what? I guess it's a three. Maybe not. I thought you were a cop at the start of Exorcist like, 3 or something. No, it might have just been like. It might have just been nice and good, right? Yeah. Just that, I might have challenged my memory. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that happened. <laughs> yes, I'll, but I'll trust your memory. William Peter Black. <laughs> well, that was the ninth configuration. A lot of people like it. I. That was one of the most bizarre experiences of my life, <laughs> and I think a number of people's lives. Many of them are dead. But, it was Blatty's idea to take all these American actors over to Budapest, where we shot it, for two and a half months, when in the States, part of that I did would have worked two and a half weeks, maybe at the most. So, everybody thought, well, it's a good payday. Money goes right into your bank, um, and you live on per diem. It was a lot of per diem. We found out pretty quick why, but um, so you could eat, drink, and everything. And we all put up at the Budapest Hilton Hotel. And it was all swallow jello, and everybody thought, "Well, yeah, this is, it'll be fun. And we could go to Prague. And we could go to..." Uh, Warsaw, we can go to uh, Moscow, we can go to anywhere. We can go to Paris on the weekend when you're not working and, and have a wonderful two and a half months. Because you know your part wasn't going to be working all the time because you didn't have a big part. So he thought he'd get a good ensemble effort. So, um, help me here. 
Neville Grand, Moses Gunn, Bob Loja went over, they were there, and they thought, which is great, take all this for Dean <laughs> and take it over to Yugoslavia, transfer it into American money. Wow. The, the per diem was in forens, which was what the uh, Hungarian money is called, and it had absolutely not one penny of value huh. outside of Hungary. <laughs> so as soon as you went over the border, that's it. You couldn't spend it anywhere except in Hungary. So we all went to the most expensive restaurant we could, and you can only do that for a week and a half, and then you're you're tired of dying. <laughs> Press things and uh, oh, it was crazy. And it was not. So it was Nicole Williamson was the the main guy, and he started out. He was in the middle of a terrible divorce going on from England. <laughs> I feel like a gossip columnist, <laughs> but it's the truth. He was going through a terrible divorce, and Budapest and Hungary were behind the Iron Curtain at the time. So when you got on the phone to talk, there were no cell phones then, it was 1978. You got on the phone from the hotel, and you talk to your wife in California, and then call it in, just go away in the middle of it. Honey, how God never be covered. And he was talking to his attorney about the fourth time it happened in the first week. And it cut off and went away. And Nicole Williamson threw everything that he could fit through the front window out the front window. The couch, the tables, phone, which he threw out of the wall and vases and everything on the front street. And immediately, the guys in gray suits were at, up in his room, and then uh, they said, uh, Blatty, um, he has to leave. He can't be here anymore. And Blatty said, I shot a week. Shot a week in the movie, for Christ's sake. He's a star from Carrie. He's gone. He's not welcome in Hungary. <laughs> so they brought got rid of him. He went home and they brought Stacy Keach in his role. And at the very first day of shooting, Mike Moriarty was the, uh, the part that Scott Wilson ended up playing. But Mike Moriarty, Gladys is wonderfully eccentric Catholic who um, mentor Michael Moriarty and sort of adopted him as his Catholic child and, and knew that he was going to play this role and they they worked on this movie for three years, the two of them. And we got over there on the first day on the set, all of us in costume, even though hardly any of us were working, on, on the set outside the room that they were shooting the scene in. Eddie Flanders, Mike Moriarty, and Nicole Williams, and uh, Vladimir Moriarty talked about it, talked about it, talked about it. Everybody's in place. They rehearsed the action. And Moriarty said, I don't know, Bill. I don't know. I don't know. What's my character? I don't know what it is. And Maury got better, glad he said, you're fired. <laughs> uh, that was Honestly, God, first day, he's gone. Well, he wasn't gone because he couldn't get out that quick. <laughs> a couple days later, he's on a plane back to, uh, to LA. And then Gladys scrambled and bumped people around and moved uh, Scott up into that role. And, yeah, it was, it was nuts. It was nuts. <laughs> Any fun memories of working with Scott? But yeah, yeah. And uh, fun memories of working with uh, Jason Miller. Oh, yeah. Joe Spinell, too. Oh, my God. 
But you haven't seen this movie. It was great. It was great. Working with him, but but more than the working with him, it was the drinking with him, <laughs> socializing with him, and getting into trouble with him in uh, Hungary. Yeah, it was a it was a unique experience and weird. Yeah. Well, as we as we start to wind down, we should probably talk about Night of the Creeps. Yeah. My favorite. Uh, let's talk about you know, some fond record of recollections from the shoot. I mean, how did that come about? Working with Fred. Fred wanted me to do the part, and I didn't. I just I met with him out there, and we put the script over. I he sent me the script, and so I met with him at Bill Finnegan or Bill something or other out there at the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, my favorite hunt, and at the time. And uh, I remember saying to him, God, this is a wonderful part for me. Thanks, it's great. And I said, oh, all of the wonderful lines I think to say. So we, uh, we had a great time doing it. And we shot a lot of it on Southern County University. Yeah. The one down below the convention center in LA, um, yeah, USC, USC, full of uh, young new pile co-eds. Oh my God, I can't say <laughs> shit like that anymore. But, but, but it was true, and it was, we just had fun. And the, the three silly jibbles, um, Jason Lively, and um, oh, it, it, it helped me. Joe, and um, oh, he's Canadian. Back up in Canada now, but we had a wonderful time shooting, and Fred was great. But, but I was concerned. The very first day I was called um, around noon, noon one o'clock, something like that. The location down there in USC. So I'm down, I, I go into the thing, and they said, you know, uh, put your outfit on and all that shit. And I'm it's a jaded detective. Raggy ass clothes. And so I, I do everything. I even put my gun on the strap and everything. And, I'm, and about 10.30 that night, uh, PA came over and said, They're ready for you on set, Mr. Atkins. And I said, No shit, are they? How many fucking hours have I been sitting here? <laughs> well, you've got to be high and you've got to, you know. So I go over to the over the set, Fred says, I know you're going to kill me. I hope you still come to work tomorrow, but all I want you to do, because we're so we can't do what we wanted to do, but all I want you to do is these two kids, Crutches Boy and uh, Jason Lively, are going to walk down this path. You're going to step out onto the path. <laughs> that was it. And it was a shot of my feet. <laughs> it could have been anybody's feet. <laughs> I think it would have been, in retrospect, it would have been hysterical if it had been stiletto heels instead of the back. But anyway, that was the first day, and I thought, oh my god, this is going to be a terrible, long, tedious shoot. But it was. It was great. It has found its audience over time, which is great. Yeah, it has. Yeah, and, so, and so is Halloween 3. Yeah. You know, a lot of people didn't like them when they first came out, but it's certainly grown into something fun. I'm curious, when Stephen King asked you what was Jimmy Lee really like, what was your answer? <laughs> I. I said, she was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> she was great. She was 19 and I was 34. She was great. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that totally in the sense that she was a great young kid actor. There was no, uh, nothing else there. <laughs> she, was, she was great. She so desperately wanted to be a star. And you can tell, and her mom was a star. And she, 
Janet Lee, she was wonderful on the set to work with. Great lady and early man. I have worked with some nice people. Um, Bit of joy. Yeah, before we wrap up, I just wanted to, I, one, of, one of the great joys for me was seeing you pop up in my Bloody Valentine 3D, and then again, got angry with the uh, fact that here and Todd Farmer. Yeah. Uh, and then at that point, correct me if I'm wrong, but were, were you kind of retired from acting when you had done my Bloody Valentine? Hey man, you can remember the words and somebody is silly enough to hire you or ask, you don't ever retire. <laughs> <laughs>
In fact, I never talked to you about Halloween 3 because I, I yeah, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a part for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a doctor. I was going to be a doctor taking care of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good doctor. Uh, evil, kind of. But it was, uh, yeah, I thought it was a terrific part, but it uh, didn't happen. Maybe well, someday. You never know. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Sure.